start sequentially here, but within the pre, you know, K through 12, oops, sorry, I said to hit the got it, uh, pre K through 12 uh, segments of the market, you know, we are seeing a tremendous, uh, you know, market opportunity in terms of learning uh, gaps. Uh, you know, this has been uh, really kind of exacerbated by, uh, you know, everything that's happened over the last couple of years with COVID, of course. Um, you know, you've been keeping up with the press, uh, you know, reading and math efficiency scores, uh, you know, for U.S., uh, you know, fourth to eighth graders have been on a, a rapid decline uh, over the last couple of years. And in fact, um, you know, this past October, there was a study that showed that, uh, you know, just 26 percent of eighth graders are proficient in math, which is, uh, you know, down significantly from uh, actually 34 percent in, in 2019. So, you know, not to say that it was fantastic in 2019, but clearly we're moving, uh, you know, in a slightly backwards direction. And, you know, that challenge right now uh, is being met by uh, the fact that we also are having teacher shortages. Um, so there was a significant wave of retirements and, uh, you know, burnout from teachers during COVID. And, you know, if you talk to districts, you know, two thirds of, you know, roughly you know, 1,200 school and district leaders kind of reported a teacher shortage right now. So, we're kind of seeing this large opportunity uh, and, you know, gap in learning uh, while at the same time seeing a significant teacher shortage to address it. Uh, and so what we're seeing a lot more of right now is technology aimed at helping to scale uh, the capabilities of teachers, helping to deliver personalized learning uh, and assessments so that we can better meet learners, uh, you know, kind of where they are. Um, in the post-secondary side, there's trends around, uh, you know, Mason College. Uh, you know, more relevant, more uh, sort of tangible in terms of what the value is for the learner. Um, and so we're starting to see more in terms of university and employer uh, partnerships. Uh, and so you can even see, you know, with companies like Google or with companies like Amazon, uh, certification programs that are kind of coming out in, you know, universities are starting to pair up with companies to deliver some of these solutions as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, as we have demographic shifts right now within post-secondary, we're seeing uh, continued kind of focus on retention and recruitment, uh, a lot of focus also on international student flow, given kind of the global nature of edu education. Uh, and then in the career and workforce, skilling and upskilling, um, you know, mentorship, you know, vertical industry learning, these are all really, really critical uh, you know, areas within education technology right now that we're seeing a lot of innovation in. Uh, and this goes for, by the way, I think we, we all probably are familiar with some level of boot camps and, uh, you know, AI and data skills, uh, things of that nature, coding. But one of the other very, very interesting, I think, categories uh, that we're seeing in vertical interest learning is all the other, um, you know, areas. So you think about frontline workers, you think about teachers, you think about nursing, you think about uh, vocational skills learning. All of these are undergoing. Uh, you know, pretty dramatic transformation right now where technology is playing an important and critical role. And then, of course, uh, you know, when you think about additional trends right now, uh, you know, it's hard to, to ignore the fact that artificial intelligence is all over, um, you know, all of our feeds right now. It's impacting education. Uh, you know, clearly there's going to be ways where, you know, we need to figure out how to better uh, leverage the technology how to teach our students uh, and adults, frankly, as well, not just, uh, you know, young, young people, but adults, how to, uh, how to really sort of utilize and leverage artificial intelligence um, and artificial intelligence tools, uh, you know, in their day-to-day. -day. Uh, another thread that we're seeing is around student wellness, uh, you know, in particular, I think one of the dramatic impacts on, uh, on learners is the fact that the last couple of years had seen a, a significant spike uh, in depression rates, uh, you know, at every single level, um, you know, of education and, uh, you know, that directly uh, impacts academic performance and academic outcomes as well. And so we really think hard about, uh, you know, what are the other ways that we can support, uh, you know, learners in their journey? And it's not, it's not just about assessments and curriculum, although the, uh, clearly those are important, but it's also around, uh, you know, the student and emotional uh, wellness of, uh, of the learner along the way. So let me just kind of transition. I'm zipping through a little bit here uh, pretty quickly, just kind of given we got a, a slightly later start, but I want to make sure to leave time for, uh, you know, for questions as well. But, you know, starting up an ed tech company, um, you know, I think it's, it's no different starting up any company. There's all kinds of things that, of course, you can find and think about, uh, you know, addressable market, uh, team, uh, you know, the opportunity, et cetera. But I think within, you know, ed tech in particular, like what, what are some of the nuances that that we really think about or that we really see founders kind of focusing on 
One is kind of having that authentic founder market fit. Uh, I think particularly within education, uh, you know, there's typically a, a strong connection, a strong personal, um, you know, reason for, uh, you know, for that founder to be starting this particular company, whether it's personal in nature or whether it's based on professional experience uh, and experiences. I think that that authenticity is, is really, really important to kind of drive, uh, drive the scale and, and the growth of that company. I think it is important within EdTech also to think really, really hard about kind of what the product is and what the business model is. Uh, I think we've definitely seen uh, in the past uh, ed tech companies that have gotten started because there was a great mission, there was a great uh, kind of purpose behind it. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, less of a focus on kind of what is the business, uh, you know, what is the, uh, you know, sort of monetization opportunity from that perspective. And I'll just say that, uh, you know, Chris and I talked a little bit about this uh, as we prepared for this session. Um, in that, you know, not every education tech company needs to be venture backed, and, and frankly, not every education tech company needs to be for profit either. Uh, and so I think there are, you know, absolutely uh, ideas and opportunities uh, that are better served from a nonprofit perspective. Uh, you know, there are opportunities that are, you know, from a for profit perspective. You know, we really believe that, uh, you know, as a venture fund, of course, we are backing and supporting, uh, you know, the for profit uh, companies or the companies that have a commercial. Uh, you know, modality to them. And, you know, part of the reason for that is so that, you know, these companies can continue to scale and reinvest, uh, you know, into, uh, you know, into their businesses and reach, you know, more and more learners. And so I think that's uh, a slightly nuanced distinction within, within education technology. Um, but I would also direct you to, you know, our own website, uh, you know, at LVC, where, you know, we do have an outcomes report. And I think it's helpful to kind of just read a little bit about, you know, hey, these are all in our portfolio, at least for profit companies, but, um, you know, what are the things that they're trying to achieve in terms of outcomes for their stakeholders? And that's really, really important, uh, you know, to us as a firm and a fund as well. Um, and so on that note, I think thinking about what is the outcome, uh, you know, you're hoping to deliver and, and then understanding who the user is and who the buyer is. I think that's pretty important uh, within education technology because oftentimes uh, the buyer uh, of the product may not be uh, the user. And so really kind of distinguishing how you're serving and how you're delivering uh, both for the user and also what is the value and who's paying for it. And then on terms of applying for ad tech opportunities, uh, you know, I'd just say, of course, research the opportunity, the market, the company, uh, you know, I think, you know, really sort of what's valuable, I think oftentimes to folks that are coming from outside the sector, of course, Google has a big, um, you know, division within, within education, but for, you know, even for folks that, that didn't work in that group, uh, there's a lot to bring to the table. Uh, I think we've seen an influx and a real, uh, you know, deluge of, of talent that is coming into the tech sector over the last couple of years. And that's something that we really welcome. And so, you know, based on your experience, you know, what are you bringing, uh, you know, to the company and uh, how is that differentiated? And then also, what is your connection, you know, to the mission and the business? And, and lastly, just thinking about, you uh, you know, who are those Googlers, uh, you know, that, um, you know, are already there, because my guess is that there's, you know, probably quite a few already. Uh, and so just on that note, I just wanted to flag, um, you know, a couple of ex-Googlers, uh, you know, that are already kind of in leadership roles, uh, you know, in our portfolio, just kind of to give you a, a, a sense of the breadth uh, of companies. And so, um, you know, Matt Gottsbeck, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, just recently, uh, for the last really kind of five to eight years was, uh, or maybe even longer off the top of my head, but was uh, CEO of Quizlet. Um, he's currently a board, board member, but we uh, just transitioned to be more of an advisor. Uh, but he ran, uh, you know, for many years, uh, YouTube, uh, at VP of product management at YouTube and was at Google for a very, very long time. Uh, on the newer side, uh, Rajan Seth, who, uh, you know, was at Google for 17 years. Uh, and again, kind of speaking of AI, uh, you know, now founded Chiron Learning is focusing on how to leverage AI to scale uh, tutoring uh, and to help scale the resources of limited uh, you know, teachers. Uh, and then in Africa, just to kind of give you a sense of the global nature, uh, Tim, uh, who was at Google and was the Africa lead at Google, uh, co-founded, uh, founded uh, U-Lesson, uh, you know, which is delivering uh, solution, learning solutions to K-12 students, uh, you know, all across uh, the African continent. Uh, and of course, not everybody, uh, you know, needs to go or, um, you know, is, is in a sort of mentality or position to necessarily found a company. And that's totally uh, fine as well, because, you know, clearly these are all, you know, very, very large, um, you know, companies and growing. And, 
you know, there are even in this environment, um, you know, plenty of opportunities at education technology companies that are, uh, you know, really interesting. And so, yes. I'm sorry. Could you mind going one back one slide? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you see uh, the names of uh, someone's trying to clarify the names of these uh, Zooglas here? Um, would you mind repeating the names again? Yeah. So yeah, Matt, Matt Blackbag, Blackbag, Rajan yeah. Shed, and Sim Shigaya. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting, Ian. Thank you. No, no, no worries. And then lastly, I'll just say that um, you know if you if you have an interest, this is a tangible uh, you know a, a tangible sort of step to take as well, uh, which is that you know we have um, and I'm sure there are other places that, where you can indicate your interest, but we have a talent network, uh, you know where you can input your uh, information, your profile, and uh, you know as our companies uh, you know start to uh, you know look for uh, new new uh, employees, and uh, this talent network will actually start to uh, match uh, uh, based on your indicated interest, and we'll um, you know we'll email you and ping you uh, and connect you with those companies. So it really kind of exists in the background, and you know helps you surface opportunities as they come up. So I know I zipped through all of that. I didn't uh, get into all the detail that I probably wanted to, but I, I did want to leave uh, more time for questions than less. And so hopefully that all um, came across clearly. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ian. Really appreciate it. I think we're going to have more people who are looking to join versus not join. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple more questions and then um, the patient leave uh, waiting. Ms. iPad, uh, I'll get to you, your questions. So feel free for those who want to ask questions, just raise your hands here. Um, I think the main thing is trying to get your thoughts on starting slash joining a nonprofit versus for-profit. And you did outline some backgrounds of how to do the assessment, but what are some key questions someone should ask if they're looking to either join or perhaps co-found a startup in the education space? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, let, me, let me put my screen back up as I talk just so we have it here. So, um, so just in terms of what are, what are some of the things to think about, um, you know, I really do think that figuring out where you are convicted, where you have that authentic kind of founder market fit, um, you know, is really important. And again, this doesn't have to be a, a founder, uh, to your point, Chris, um, you know, element. It could be just as an employee, uh, you know, as well. Um, you know, it is hard, I would say, um, you know, for folks to, to sort of really get excited about, um, you know, companies if they don't believe in that, in the mission, uh, you know, of what the company is trying to achieve. Um, and sometimes those, again, as I mentioned, may take the form of a nonprofit, um, you know, or a social impact type of company. Um, and so I think that's a lot driven by, uh, you know, how the company got set up and established, um, you know, number one, number two, also sort of what is the ambition of, uh, of the founder themselves? Um, you know, I think sometimes, uh, you know, there are plenty of, again, education, uh, you know, companies where, uh, you know, either teachers, uh, you know, have started them uh, and they're you know, fantastic kind of, uh, you know, commercial, uh, you know, companies. Um, but we do also see a lot of folks that are coming out of other nonprofit type of service organizations that are uh, drawn to education and found nonprofit companies. I'd say uh, many of the companies where, uh, you know, we start to see former Googlers involved, um, you know, just because, again, Google, uh, again, is a commercial enterprise, uh, you know, do, do have uh, more of that commercial mindset. But, you know, that, that's obviously, uh, you know, not a, not a blanket statement, uh, you know, per se, but um, thinking about, uh, I think the other thing to really kind of think about is, you know, who is the user, who is the buyer? Um, and that really does help to define, you know, is this more of a sort of nonprofit or is it, you know, really kind of a, uh, you know, could it be a commercial, uh, you know, company that can scale, um, you know, because, you know, where are these budgets coming from? If you're looking at, you know, K-12 companies, are, are they coming from families because there are a lot of direct consumer type businesses? Uh, you know, are they, uh, you know, coming through, uh, you know, funding from, you know, schools and school districts? Uh, you know, this is one of the trends I would say that the, the government, um, the U.S. government, uh, as an example, uh, you know, over the last couple of years has launched, uh, you know, what they call ESSER funding. Um, that's about $200 billion, uh, you know, of funding that is going out to uh, you know, education, um, 
you know, a lot of which does sort of touch and influence kind of ed tech. Uh, and so there's different types of funding sources, whether it's, uh, you know, private funding sources or, uh, you know, government, uh, you know, type of funding sources for education companies. So really kind of understanding, I think, the nuances uh, of that will help you figure out, uh, you know, what, what is the better sort of modality. Cool. Thank you so much, um, Ian. Let's actually talk about uh, folks. Um, Ian and I um, had discussed and shared that we have a breakdown of people who want to join companies and start companies. So let's actually break it down where the first uh, 15 minutes of this chat will actually be the remain of the chat will be actually for people who want to join and the final 15 minutes to actually people who actually want to start. So it's not too confusing. We jump back and forth. Hope that's okay with everyone. So let's start with uh, people who are looking to join. Um, Ian, you help a lot of your leaders actually hire, perhaps explore resumes, talk to your friends who are looking to uh, join companies. Can you actually share what people from larger companies should be aware of in their resumes and what they say in it, but also the networking portion of how to interact with people as they're looking to join companies? Yeah, I don't know that there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I would say just generally are good to do, obviously, um, you know, in terms of some of the job searching and identification, as I mentioned, um, you know, it's always great to start with, uh, you know, your warm connections, any former Googlers, uh, you know, that are already at the company. And frankly, you know, even if you don't know them, um, you know, from Google, I think there's always that affinity uh, and being able to sort of reach out and, um, you know, have that common, you know, background, uh, you know, to, to really kind of kick off the conversation. Um, I think the second thing is, really kind of think hard about what is this, you know, what is the company doing uh, right now? And, you know, what is the unique and differentiated kind of skills that you bring? Um, and in particular, I think as you interview with companies, uh, you know, there is, I think, again, as I mentioned, this authenticity that kind of comes out where, uh, you know, you're tying all of the skills um, and experiences and, and frankly, network as well that you've uh, you know, built up over the years, uh, you know, whether it's Google or, or at a prior, uh, you know, company. And, you know, thinking about how does that advance the ball, uh, you know, for you know, this company, this ed tech company. Uh, and I think you'll be surprised, like, this is probably a little bit, um, it's certainly very true a few years ago. Uh, and I think people appreciated it, which is that, uh, you know, there's always a conversation around, oh, should we bring somebody on board, uh, you know, that, that has been a career, call it career ed tech person, uh, that has owned, that has worked at ed tech companies now for you know 15 years or 20 years or 25 years. I think the interesting thing is that uh, the reality is that there's actually very few of those people, um, mm -hmm. and you know part of that is just a reflection of uh, you know how sort of recently uh, ed tech has started to uh, scale. Uh, again, you know our firm, you know we started uh, less than 10 years ago. Uh, and I'd say there's very few, um, you know, people that, that you could find, uh, you know, 20 years ago uh, or 15 years ago that have been, you know, say, focused on education investing because there just weren't that many, uh, you know, folks. And, and part of the challenge was the infrastructure wasn't, you know, all the way there at the time. So the one of the advantages, I think, is the fact that, uh, you know, there are a lot of new people kind of coming into the space and bringing fresh ideas. Uh, and so it's that kind of interesting mix between uh, folks that have been, spent a career with the net tech, which are, you know, relatively few uh, that have spent more than five years in net tech, frankly, uh, and folks that bring just a, a real wealth of experience from other scaled companies, i.e. obviously Google, um, to help these organizations think about uh, and really almost see around the corner. I think there's a lot of processes, a lot of uh, structure, a lot of learning, um, and you know, that, that you would bring from a Google experience that would be tremendously valuable for, uh, for an ed tech company almost at any scale, because by definition, uh, I think every single ed tech company out there is a smaller organization relative to, to Google. Thanks, Ian. Um, and, and just on that point, a lot of our attendees are perhaps not engineers, and they're trying to figure out what are non-technical roles that are available and needed from folks coming from Google. You sit on the board of quite a few different companies. Could you share more about what yeah. are you what areas are they investing in which are non-technical that a lot of the, our attendees can sort of think about applying? And also, if jobs are not available on the website, should they be actually messaging leaders in those companies? Because some of the best jobs may not be posted online as well. 
for, for sure. Uh, I think that's true in anything, um, you know, whether it's ed tech or not. Uh, I think, you know, there are plenty of roles that frankly go filled that, that don't quite make it to the board, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, it is always good, I think, to, uh, you know, shake the trees, talk to people, uh, you know, really kind of express your interest and make it known. Um, I think that's just something that is, is so important is making your interest known so that, uh, you know, people can be thinking about you when, you know, these opportunities kind of pop up or even are discussed. Uh, because the earlier, of course, that you can get yourself into that flow, um, you know, through a warm connection uh, that, you know, respects and, and sort of is excited about everything that you bring to the table, the, the better those discussions go, obviously. Um, you know, uh, 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 non-engineering roles, plenty, um, you know, it's, and it's not a surprise, uh, you know, again, ed tech SaaS companies, as an example, or ed tech, you know, uh, internet companies, uh, you know, are, are really kind of no different in terms of the roles that they require. And so, uh, you know, there's plenty of, um, you know, sales roles, uh, you know, within ed tech companies, there's plenty of customer success roles, uh, you know, within ed tech companies, um, you know, that are, that are non-technical in nature. And then of course, uh, you know, from the finance and accounting side, uh, you know, the uh, current environment would, you know, again, sort of make it important for every single company, whether it's that tech or not, uh, to have that fiscal responsibility to really be, uh, you know, looking and uh, analyzing, uh, you know, their, their balance sheet and thinking about what the business is going to deliver. And so, um, so yeah, I think that tech companies have, have all of those roles, uh, similar to other uh, technology companies. Specific for your companies, which you're very close with, is remote work still okay? Are people trying to get people in the office or what should people think about as they apply for jobs uh, for a lot of the companies that are still hiring today? Yeah, it's it's a spread um, for sure. Although again, I would say there's probably more uh, opportunities that are remote friendly um, than maybe the, you know, butter for general ecosystem. And again, just a function of, um, you know, how, how, sort of when these companies got started. Uh, at some level, some of these companies got started completely remote, you know, mm -hmm. from the get-go. And so uh, it's not that much of a culture shift. Uh, you know, I think companies, of course, that, you know, are thinking a lot about this are companies that have been around for, for much longer. And, and that's okay, too. So I think it just depends on the, the company and the opportunity. Um, but we, the one thing I would say is we do see, uh, because the opportunity is so international, uh, you know, plenty of companies that have, um, you know, even if they're not, quote unquote, 100 percent remote, um, you know, have satellite offices, have remote workers in international uh, you know, countries or, or frankly, uh, internationally domiciled headquarters companies that have remote workers in the U.S. Um, and so, you know, we have a company uh, called Leap Finance, uh, as one example, it's an education technology company, as you can uh, infer from the name, that also works with um, some of the financing aspects of uh, international study abroad uh, and students that are coming, uh, you know, from from India to to the U.S. and the majority of the team actually is based in India, but uh, we also have, uh, you know, a few of the leaders uh, of the company uh, that are that are here in the U.S. So I think if remote is something that is important, uh, there are certainly plenty of opportunities, um, you know, in the in not only in our portfolio but just in ed tech, you know, generally, uh, you know that that uh, would be remote friendly and that you can frankly filter on that um, request as well. Now, maybe here's a, also a tip, right? For companies that you've invested in, but that's not in the US yet, if you see an opportunity for them to expand to the US, even message them directly, right? But I think that's a good way to, to start building that relationship before they expand to the US. So um, I know a lot of people are trying to find more unique ways to get ahead of the curve of people's job hunting practices. So thanks for sharing, Ian. Um, in terms of yeah. uh, folks who are looking to change their resumes and position it differently. Have you shared a lot of advice with your own friends who maybe come from bigger companies where, hey, stop using Google Speak or Amazon Speak, uh, really talk about how to position your resume for startups and in this case, ad tech startups. Um, any other piece of advice on that front, uh, Ian, that you could share? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, um, you know, really trying to articulate uh, sort of how you fit in and what your excitement is with the company. Um, again, I think a lot of the skill sets, uh, you know, are probably going to be similar. Um, you know, again, you know, if you're developing a, a SaaS uh, solution or if you're delivering, uh, you know, an AI driven, uh, you know, tutoring, uh, you know, opportunity to the market, a lot of those underlying core skill sets are still the same. Um, but I think 
really kind of tailoring the message, the outreach, uh, you know, talking to the people, talking to people at the company about what it is that you're really excited about and where you see your opportunity to contribute. Uh, I think that sort of wraparound is really important. Um, you know, everyone, I think ultimately, if it's a, you know, if it's a technical role, then, you know, you will obviously get into the technical, um, you know, elements of a, you know, of a process in the interview. But, um, you know, before you get there, I think people just kind of still really kind of resonate with, I mean, a lot of these companies, again, as, as they're getting going, um, you, know, you take, you know, Chiron, you know, as an example with Roger, I mean, there's only a, uh, you know, there's, there's only a few people, you know, at the company, of course, at the beginning, you know, then there's larger companies like Quizlet, uh, you know, of course, but I, I do think that kind of wrapping around your resume, you know, why are you excited and, you know, what do you bring uh, that's specific to uh, kind of this company is, is really, really important. And some folks also also wonder whether there's always a trade-off going to ed tech or education or other industries like that, that's, they need to accept lower compensation. Can you share more about who, should that be the case or given that it's a for-profit industry, in many cases, they should expect industry standard compensation. Clearly, it may not be Google level standard, but they shouldn't uh, think about going to education and trade off their compensation. Yeah, yeah I, you know, uh, right. So maybe not Google level uh, per se, but I, I would say uh, that it shouldn't vary, you know, all that much uh, at the end of the day. Again, um, it does depend on is this, you know, clearly if it's a nonprofit or a, you know, for-profit commercial uh, scaling company, but, um, you know, these are, these are companies that are competing in the market for talent. Um, and so they recognize that, um, you know, people are, uh, you know, coming for a reason, but at the same time are not necessarily trying to make a comp trade off per se. So, um, no, so no, I guess my, 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 my sort of reaction to that question, Chris, is it's less about, hey, expect to, to sort of, quote unquote, make less than, than market. Um, you know, more so, I think it's, it's really interesting just the energy uh, that people bring to these roles and, and the why that they want to join. And I think the unique thing about ed tech companies, frankly, I'd, I'd probably say it's less about, oh, is there a compensation difference? It's more that, uh, you know, frankly, I feel like a lot of ed tech companies are able to punch above their weight, so to speak, in terms of attracting, um, you know, talent because people resonate with, uh, you know, part, of, you know, with with what the company is doing in terms of, uh, in terms of the mission, in terms of the outcomes. But at the same time, if this is a scaled venture back company, you should, you know, very well expect to be, uh, you know, compensated at market or, you know, functionally what is market for your role. Right. So as I transition from joining a, co a company to starting one. There's a couple of other questions that perhaps uh, they arrive a bit later. Can you reshare what uh, areas, international trends you're most excited about, but also companies you're excited about and why, especially in the US? I know you showed some slides before, but just for folks who are perhaps joining a bit later. Um, yeah, here's a couple of companies. Um, sorry, then give me a thumbs up, Chris. I know, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, so just the themes and trends, and again, this is by no means exhaustive uh, in terms of the themes and trends. It's uh, you know I, I tried to just kind of highlight a few things uh, you know that we're we're seeing in the market. But uh, you know if you're for for a founder or if you're thinking about sort of launching a tech company, uh, I think there is no shortage of opportunities in the market right now in terms of problems to go solve and address. Um, you know again, there's huge learning gaps right now in the K-12 um, you know segment for. Uh, you know, kids that are you know, growing up in the last couple of years, uh, you know, without sort of the traditional kind of learning environment, um, you know, and again, we have companies, uh, you know, companies that frankly right now are addressing, uh, you know, a number of these, um, to your point, Chris. So, you know, from a learning gap standpoint uh, and personalized learning, uh, you know, Chiron Learning, as I mentioned, um, you know, is, is one. Uh, you know, again, this varies by geography, uh, you know, as well, uh, meaning that there are opportunities in every geography, uh, you know, for these types of companies. And so, um, you know, you lesson in Africa is doing that for uh, the K-12 market. We have another company called Lapster, uh, you know, in Denmark that is delivering stimulation-based training, uh, you know, for essentially labs and, you know, really kind of getting into personalized learning, uh, you know, through, through the sciences. Um, you know, on the post-secondary side, I think I mentioned earlier, uh, company Leap Finance, uh, you know, we also, uh, you know, have a company called Noodle Partners uh, that is delivering an online, you know, essentially program 
uh, capabilities to traditional universities. Um, you know, in the career and workforce side, uh, you know, we've uh, invested in companies like uh, Interplay Learning that's doing simulation-based training for uh, HVAC technicians and electricians, uh, as an example, um, you know, which is a little bit different, probably not the first thing people think about when they think about ed tech, but, uh, you know, it's a really, really interesting market. Um, you know, companies like Degreed uh, that are delivering what they call kind of learning experience platforms, um, you know, and from a skilling and upskilling standpoint to, you know, help companies, uh, you know, assess the sort of skills inventory of employee of their employee base, um, you know, as an example. Um, and then on the AI side, uh, you know, a lot of companies are incorporating AI, of course. Uh, we have, there's another company called Workera, um, you know, which, which you see here. Uh, they actually have an open COO role uh, right now. So this maybe ties into a little bit of your question before, Chris, about non-technical roles. But, um, you know, Workera uh, is a company that was you know, founded and launched. Uh, you know, we he funded it with Andrew Ng, who, uh, you know, had launched Coursera um, and obviously de delivers a lot of lecturing and uh, teaching around AI. Um, and this is a, a company that is helping uh, organizations and enterprises, uh, you know, deliver what they call precision upskilling, um, you know, so a lot of different assessment tools around AI, uh, machine learning, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, so I, I can go on and on. We have, no, we have I, I think that's a good, that. um, keep a scrolling good through, but just to kind of give you a flavor. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. Um, let's go to Ashwin's question. Ashwin, do you want to unmute or should I just ask your question directly? I want to give Ashwin an opportunity to unmute if he wanted to. If not, I'll go straight into it. Um, so what are your thoughts on technology enabled offline learning for children, especially in the context of the COVID slash screen fatigue? Yeah, I think, I think it's really, really important. Um, you know, anything that can take, uh, you know, kids off of screens, but, you know, still in, in sort of provide that learning. Um, I think it's really important. It's a huge market opportunity. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that, um, you know, companies have, at least approached it so far. I don't, I think we're frankly just scratching the surface right now. Um, but there are companies, uh, you know, like uh, Tinker Garden as an example, that is, you know, essentially a marketplace uh, embedded with uh, curriculum for outdoor, you know, play and learning. Uh, so they, they're really kind of coordinating, um, you know, almost like outdoor learning infused play groups at some level, uh, and also providing curriculum to, uh, to schools to do the same. Uh, you know, we've seen companies uh, or been, you know, pitched to by companies that are, uh, you know, embedding, um, you know, kind of voice activated, uh, voice activated toys that provide kind of learning, uh, you know, as well. And so there's kind of a voice interaction, uh, but it takes you off of the screen um, so that kids aren't, you know, kind of just glued to, uh, you know, an iPad all the time. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think long winded way of saying, I think it's a, a really, really interesting opportunity um, you know, I think I have three kids myself, uh, you know, I think parents are always looking for learning modalities that don't involve, uh, you know, just the screen and, you know, to the extent that it can be tech enabled uh, in some form or fashion and, and scalable uh, can be really, really interesting. Audiobooks, um, you know, uh, you know, we've been pitched different companies where, uh, you know, students uh, or young kids can, you know, essentially have, you know, books that they then play to themselves and listen, um, you know, but, but doesn't necessarily involve the screen and, has questions and, and answers and things of that nature. Thanks, Ian. Um, Nikolai, do you want to unmute and ask your question directly? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. It's been great so far. Uh, just wondering, you talked about yeah. business models and the importance of thinking through that. Uh, it seems clearer to me when your customers are professionals, businesses, schools, et cetera. Have, mm. have you got any advice when the benefit of your product accrues more to kids? Um, and indirectly their parents, how to think through business models, or if you've seen any examples, good examples of that. Sure. Yeah, I think for, for kids, um, you know, there's, there's quite a few examples. Uh, and I think this really kind of gets into what I mentioned earlier around uh, the user may not also be the buyer. Uh, and so kind of distinguishing between the two, um, you know, is important or understanding kind of the nuances uh, of the two is really important, but, you know, we have, um, you know, for example, uh, a company called Lingo Ace, uh, you know, that is doing Mandarin uh, tutoring, uh, as an example, tech enabled because there's a curriculum, there's a, uh, a specific um, uh, kind of learning platform uh, that they have as well. 
Uh, and, you know, for parents in that case, in fact, my son uh, uses it and has testing in seven minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the value, of course, uh, there is, you know, I'd like my son to learn Mandarin uh, in this case, or, you know, if it's English in another region or Spanish or, or whatnot. Um, and, you know, again, really trying to figure out where is that um, sort of constraint in the system or where is the friction in the system? And, you know, frankly, in Mandarin, as one example, there's, there's not always uh, easy access to a, a Mandarin teacher, um, you know, just around the corner per se. Um, you know, that's frankly also true, I'd say, for, uh, you know, a lot of different subjects, um, you know, uh, just kind of depending on, you know, where you live. Uh, there's just differential access to, uh, you know, teaching and teaching resources. Um, and, and frankly, many of them can also be cost prohibitive at the same time. And so I think when it gets to kids really kind of thinking about, um, you know, what is it that you're kind of delivering? What the, is there a friction in the system uh, that exists in certain parts of the market, uh, perhaps, or maybe in all of the market? Um, and, you know, how do you sort of address that? How do you sort of help the family or help the parents sort of you know, close that gap? Uh, and then there's value there. Um, and, and to the extent that, uh, you know, to the uh, last question, to the extent that that can be done in a way also, which you know, it doesn't involve yet another, you know, two hours in front of a, you know, in front of a screen, uh, I'm sure parents would also appreciate that uh, also. So just kind of thinking about, you know, what is the challenge? What is, um, you know, what is it that you're able to deliver? And then also, you know, are there interesting twists, um, you know, in terms of how you can deliver that so that it becomes even more appealing and where parents actually get excited about, um, you know, putting their kids in, in front of, uh, you know, that program or through that type of program, whether it's, you know, partially on-screen hybrid or, or otherwise. Thank you. Um, Shri, why don't you unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hey, uh, hey, Ian, uh, great meeting you. Uh, this is Shri, yeah. and I have a question on uh, OVC investment. Like, how early do you yes. uh, start your investment? Like, is it pre-seed, seed, and what is the range of investment you typically um, deal with? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so we're stage flexible. Um, you know, we've made, uh, you know, very, very early. I mean, with, with uh, Rajan and, and Chiron, I just kind of keep bringing them up because uh, he's an ex-Googler uh, and it's, it's more recent. But um, yeah, we, we basically uh, wrote our first check, you know, behind him, basically. Uh, you know, he's coming out after 17 years, uh, you know, at Google. And, you know, that was, a you know, again, his his role at Google was compelling. His vision for what he wanted to do with Kyle was compelling, and so we, uh, you know, provided that initial, you know, funding. I, I think it does depend, um, you know, of course, in terms of, uh, you know, the founder, the founder profile, the founder background, um, you know, and what they've accomplished before, uh, you know, as to how uh, excited we are to kind of get in, you know, quote unquote, very, very early. Um, you know, of course, uh, you know, if it's uh, somebody graduating from high school with an interesting idea, but no, you know, background in starting a company, well, you know, we may, you know, just develop that relationship and stay in, in close touch a little bit longer. Um, or, or they may have to bootstrap a little bit just to kind of demonstrate. Uh, I mean, you'd be surprised when we've seen um, some really interesting companies actually started by, uh, you know, very, very young uh, folks who uh, did it in a way where the, uh, they didn't kind of approach it as traditionally, let's say, but they just demonstrated huge traction. And then the conversation immediately kind of went to, okay, what is the business model? Um, or, you know, if you are starting to develop that business model, how is that starting to scale? And what are the talents, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, enterprise or go to market or, um, you know, otherwise that, that you need to add, uh, you know, in order to, to grow this as a business uh, and less as a project. Um, so the nature of it is just a little bit of a different conversation, depending on where the individual is coming from. Uh, and then on the flip side, um, you know, we've invested in A, B, C, all the way up, uh, you know, to scaled growth rounds. Um, so that's uh, all within sort of our mandate and purview. Got so, it. So am I understanding it right that there is no, you can, you can invest as early as possible if it sounds right to you. So there's no like barrier that correct. only correct. certain stage. Got it. That's right. right. Thank you so that's much. Right. I'm going to butcher yeah, no, his name, but maybe Uche or Uche, you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Ian. Uh, my name is uh, Uche. Um, so, hi, Uche. Hi. So I am setting up a foundation, okay, with intent of um, uh, spreading uh, cloud computing in the underserved market and uh, in the mm. underrepresented communities. Okay. So what is your thought on going after grants for this kind of thing? 
you know um do you have any experience with grants you know sure yeah it's not um so we're we're not making grants so i would say from from that perspective it's not my day to day uh but but i think what you're talking about is uh is incredibly important and i suspect that you will have uh, a big audience for uh, potential grants to support uh to support that effort um you know, there's a, there's a group called New Schools that does a lot of grants uh, in the market, at least in the U.S. Um, and, you know, I, I do believe that they, uh, you know, will know many of the grant making groups as well uh, internationally, uh, just kind of given their role. But, um, but yeah, I do, there's plenty of, uh, I would say, sort of philanthropic organizations and grant making foundations uh, that are excited about, uh, you know, what you just described. Okay, thank you very much. Do you mind putting the name of the company you just mentioned in the chat window? Uh, yeah, sure. It's just called New Schools uh, Ventures. And Ian, um, do you need to rush off to pick up your kids or can we spend a couple more minutes or how's your time? Uh, we could probably spend a, a couple more minutes. Let me, uh, I know this is all getting recorded, but let me just text my wife to let her know. No worries. Uh, be very, very, very yeah, please go ahead. Um, what have you not shared with us that no one's asked a question of? I know you have a lot more data, a lot more information, a lot more ideas. Like, what what didn't we cover in the past fifty minutes that you want to make sure you share with the Zuga community? You know, I mean, I would just say that this is a really, really exciting uh, moment in time for EdTech. Um, you know, I recently just did a panel last week, and one of the things that was asked was you know, what is your kind of prediction or, or bold prediction for ed tech? And I think what what I sort of shared, and, and I'll share it again here because of this fantastic group that's, um, you know, come together is there's just so much enthusiasm and excitement for the category right now. And a lot of talent kind of coming into the sector. Uh, you know, if you were to ask me a few years ago, um, you know, what was some of the challenges? Well, there were uh, plenty of infrastructure challenges, and there still are, um, for sure. Uh, but there was uh, there was many more uh, back then that prevented, you know, companies from, uh, you know, growing and reaching the end users. Um, you know, now I would say not only have some of those, um, you know, begun to be addressed. Uh, you know, and often in, in many markets, actually, internet penetration is is is, is pretty good. It's quite good. Um, you know, certainly there's ways to go in, in other markets, but uh, I'd say. It's kind of a perfect um, sort of environment right now because the infrastructure uh, challenges, uh, you know, are getting uh, invested behind. Uh, you know, there is, you know, capital, uh, you know, to be invested into companies, uh, you know, from you know funds like ourselves, obviously. Um, and importantly, I think uh, the market is actually also, you know, more ready now than than it has been ever before, right? Um, you know, teachers. I mean, it's hard to go frankly, without oh, the last two years, without sort of hitting upon ed tech at some level, uh, either directly uh, as an adult or, in, or, or through, you know, our kids. Um, and and it wasn't perfect, uh, clearly. Um, and so, you know, part of the that therein sort of lies the opportunity. I think there's um, just kind of massive awareness now uh, of what ed tech is. Um, and, you know, also, uh, you know, I think appreciation for you know, what it can deliver, but also, uh, I think the recognition of the, the gaps, um, you know, that still need to be solved. And so there's capital, there's talent, clearly, um, you know, we're kind of reemerging a bit, uh, you know, from, uh, or at least kind of getting uh, adjusted to the new normal for COVID, um, you know, around the world. And so I think the next one, 10 to 20 years, frankly, are going to be really exciting, uh, you know, for, for education technology as a category. Thanks, Ian. I promise there'll be three more questions. Jason, please go ahead and ask your question. Maybe you want to text your wife, say it'll be five minutes later. Possibly. <laughs> Ian, I was wondering if, um, where, where do you think the biggest opportunity is in uh, ed tech? And I got a couple of examples here. Going after state retraining funds, which there's billions of dollars there that to uh, take advantage of. Is it going after uh, creating new technical training content, maybe using you know some of these new AI tools? That make it easy to to create uh, content now, uh, and and getting money from big you know enterprise companies for their training needs. Is it going after parents' pocketbooks who want to uh, you know supplement their child's education education, or is it something else? What what are you seeing as the the big opportunity? 
Um, I, I apologize. My uh, audio seemed to cut out for a second there. Could you just repeat that first part, Jason? Uh, just so wondering where the uh, where you think the biggest opportunities are in ed tech. And the first example I gave was like going after state retraining funds. Right. Uh, second one. Second one was uh, um, creating technical training uh, for large companies, uh, enterprise companies, maybe using some of these AI uh, tools now that are are available, um, or going after parents' pockets, pocketbooks, or is it something else? Yeah. Where, where are you seeing is the big opportunity? I, I think that there are, uh, I think all of those are opportunities. I would say that parents' pocketbooks right now do feel a bit more stretched, uh, just kind of given everything that's going on in the economy, uh, you know, inflation, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, kind of tr in transition. Um, and so the parent pocketbooks, there, there is still uh, a big uh, amount of spend in those categories. I think uh, it is important also to think about the geographies, um, you know, and the inclination for parents to spend. Uh, I think to different geographies, uh, you know, and cultures obviously spend a bit more as a percentage of uh, of income, uh, you know, on education. And so uh, it's a category, I'd say that, um, you know, they, there are some headwinds there uh, in the moment relative to the last couple of years, but still a big category. Um, and then, you know, in terms of uh, you know, the state retraining funds and enterprise, uh, we do think that, uh, you know, B2B, uh, you know, is also, uh, it is a big opportunity. We're starting to see, uh, you know, more and more companies start to transition, uh, you know, to B2B type of uh, opportunities. Even if you look at the big, uh, some of the public companies right now, uh, like the Udemy's or the Coursera's of the world, uh, and you just kind of take a look at what's happening inside of their business, um, you know, a big uh, sort of driver of their growth, frankly, is the enterprise segment uh, in this in this particular moment. And and again, enterprises are themselves also not immune to what's going on. Uh, you know, in in terms of uh, the economy and and budgets and spend. But uh, you know, I think they're still early enough. Um, you know, we're still early enough in the cycle for a lot of these companies from an enterprise perspective that uh, you know there's still significant traction and, and runway to go as well. Ian, this is the last question I have for you. It's how can the Zoogler community be helpful to you and your portfolio companies and your VC fund? Uh, look, I mean, I, I, this has been just fantastic um, you know, to see all this energy, as I mentioned, um, you know, and I'm just, I, I get energized by having these uh, conversations, you know, because it, it really does speak to, you know, how interesting and compelling, uh, you know, the sector is getting and has gotten. Uh, and and will get you know frankly with uh, you know more and more people uh, you know coming from uh, you know deep experiences uh, you know, whether it's technical or, or non technical frankly and so I'd say you know if there are uh, great ideas uh, you know companies that are looking to get started um, you know definitely feel free to to reach out uh, you know we are at the end of the day a venture fund and so we're looking to fund uh, you know exciting entrepreneurs uh, with scaled ideas and. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, connecting with, uh, you know, our companies, uh, as well as I mentioned the talent network, um, you know, on our website, uh, you know, and as well, uh, you know, if there are, uh, you know, other ways that, that you want to get involved, um, you know, I would just, again, encourage you to reach out to those companies that, uh, you know, that kind of speak to you, um, you know, because not every single opportunity is going to get posted. Uh, and, you know, once you kind of get those conversations going and the ball rolling, uh, you know, these, these things sort of, I, I think, really start to coalesce around, you know, what is it that you're excited about? And, you know, people will start to, you know, find you and think about you when these opportunities emerge. And so I, I'm just really thrilled, um, you know, for this uh, group. So thank you, Chris, for setting this up. Thank you, Ian. I want to let you go. You're in you know, a rush to pick up your kids, but probably do this again with you in a few months time. I appreciate you sharing so much of the Zuga community, but also opening up uh, your thoughts about where else there are other opportunities in the lines. Thank you, Ian, for the rest no, of the to answer any other further questions. Thanks, Ian. Okay. All right. Take care. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye. Our co-host here, actually, in the space, you should tell us what where we are and what Cake DeFi is. This is not an ed tech play, but I thought all of you should know who's hosting us today. Thank you, Chris. It's uh, it's always, uh, you know, all of Chris's sessions are usually energizing. So it's always great. Um, yeah, this was uh, yesterday. Chris was just looking for a space and we're like, great, let's do it here. Um, yeah, so, well, Cake DeFi, uh, we are, we've been in the Web3 space for a while. Uh, please do. It's, it's, it's always shared. Uh, nice to share with uh, Zooglers on what we're doing. 
Uh, but you know, just sort of piggybacking on what Ian was talking about, uh, you know, kick DeFi, then we build blockchains. Uh, there are a lot of job opportunities here as well. But on the same same time, you know, we try and work with Web three companies, and we have the yeah, venture fund as well. So for Zooblers who are interested, you know, it'd be great to have a chat and then see, yeah, see how we can uh, collaborate. And tell us about yourself. What did you do at Google? Uh, well, Google, I was working in the computer engine team. Uh, I did not uh, expect that I would leave Google so soon, uh, like a little bit uh, over a year. Uh, but, well, cake. Uh, it was an interesting place. At that point, it was uh, we were a little bit less than 40 people at, the point, at that point, I think. Now we are about a 200, uh, 200 odd folks team wow. uh, in Singapore. And you, so you left, went to Google, and came back? Yes. Cool. Does anyone want to raise their hands? Questions for me, questions over here, or questions overall about the Zoogle community? Happy to help answer any things very briefly if you have any. I can unmute you, or you can actually unmute yourself. Yes, yeah, someone's raising their hands. Yeah, I too. Hi, sorry, I'm yelling Hi. kids in the background. Um, but it, it's a Kangsha. Nice to see you. Sorry, my video is also off because it's just one of those times. Um, so my question was, I uh, would love to actually learn a little bit more about um, um, like blockchain in general and what your company is doing. I know you briefly touched on it, uh, but would absolutely love um, some of your journey in terms of like, um, you know, why did you come back and why blockchain or Web3 at this stage? Cool. And Kangsha, just remind me, you... I leave in Google and you are in Google US, is that correct? That's right, yes. So I left Google in 2019 actually, and uh, currently Coinbase. So I too am a little bit more interested in Web3, but uh, definitely curious about learning more in that space. Wow, uh, okay, so 2019, I, I left Google at 2020. I think that was the time we internally at Google, there was this crypto babble group uh, if I recall it, it was one of the largest groups in Google where people were doing this a lot. People were, uh, you know, I, we would see people regularly going to Coinbase's and BlockFi's and all of that. I think that was also like partly to me, the motivation was uh, I wanted to be, Web3 is still a nascent uh, like, like the space as, as such, right? So when it is developing, people usually tend to uh, associated as, oh, you know, like we, about 10 years and we want to kind of understand what it is. But then I look at it, to me personally, if we think about it, Web 1 uh, or the Web as it was called was about decentralizing our ability to consume content. If you actually think about it, it was back in the day, it was, you know, you have to go to institutions or uh, even newspapers or that was your ability to actually consume content and web decentralized it. Then web two, as we know it, the platform that we are using right now, it decentralized our ability to not just consume, but also consume and share, right? And then web three naturally is the space where it not just consume and share, but you can also own content. That's something that puts, a, puts it in a whole different paradigm. And uh, to me personally, I wanted to uh, work on that space and then I wanted to build an experience there. And uh, at Google, from a Google point of view, it doesn't really make sense uh, as, as a company. You know? So we'd rather wait it out and then go acquire the company that's doing well or see how everything plays out. So it was clear to me that that probably wasn't the best place to actually gain that experience. And uh, Cake was something that I was doing, uh, very interesting stuff because web. Web3 in itself is going through a lot of these filters now, as uh, many people in the space are aware. It's a, every day is a new day, fortunately or unfortunately in Web3 space, but it's going through its natural cycles. And uh, But Cake was very much focused on the transparency of it and then building things right. I think that's basically what connected me to the founders and uh, how they were building this company out. And uh, that's basically my personal journey. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, I don't want to take up too much time here, but please do connect out to me and then I'd love to talk more. And then, I mean, why don't you, I mean, why don't you ask a question? And I put uh, Prasanna's email in the chat too, if, if folks want to reach out to him. So, I mean, why don't you unmute and ask your question? Uh, yeah, I wanted to, I have a question for you. What is Zoogler Cafe? Tell us more <laughs> about it. What is Zoogler Cafe? Why don't you tell me? What do you think Zoogler Cafe is? Uh, a very nice Palo Alto cafe that Zoogler can go and meet there. 
Yeah, yeah. In the meantime, I'm gonna have to put the jobs links. Okay, these are these are all active jobs links, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, since I know people are looking for jobs, um, if you go to the before I answer your questions, if you go to the careers page, I paste it in the chat, you scroll down, there's jobs available. And then it says Singapore, uh, any of these, uh, some are remote too. So they have remote jobs available as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, mostly, uh, you know- mostly, A lot of jobs, geez. Yes. And mostly we are trying to hire in Singapore, but if you're in, particularly for the engineers, uh, you know, engineering, uh, yeah. like deep tech is very difficult to build in one space. So yeah, but reach out and then we can talk. Cool. Um, that's great. So I will get folks who are interested in these jobs to reach out. Uh, the final question before I answer, I mean, question about uh, Azuka Cafe. Do you need to know blockchain to join this space these days? Was there so many people with blockchain experience now? Can a newbie or noob actually go into, into this space? I So personally, uh, when I joined the company, I had zero blockchain experience. I think it's important to look at the perspective of things. Blockchain is something that's new. So uh, you know, by people in this community are, of course, you know, they're incredibly smart folks. So I do not, as long as you have the willingness to pick it up or the passion or the interest, I think that'll be fine. Uh, if you already have it, yes, definitely a plus. But uh, a lot of the people that we have onboarded recently are people, you know, without auction experience, but usually they pick it up in a matter of a month to two. It's, at the end of the day, it's a decentralization wow. concept, right? So yeah, you can pick it up. As you can tell, Prasanna is super helpful. I literally was messaging who has high-speed internet I can access to, to conduct this session and he raised his hand. So I put his LinkedIn as well here. So connect with him, anyone has questions regarding your jobs, the blockchain. What's really interesting, all these chatbots and machine learning was really hot three years ago. It sort of went down and Web3 went up and now chatbots have gone up again and, and blockchain sort of gone down. So you can never time the market. Frankly, it's just like, are there good people working around you? Are you in honestly interested in the space? Do you want to learn? and Markets come and go, right? There's no way to time markets. It's, I found new way. Some people are good at timing markets, but I think it's, you can see the job openings at, at, uh, at this company. And it's also a lot of job openings at tech and everywhere. So if you like the space, are interested, apply for it, right? Okay. Uh, so Zuga Cafe.